So uh, my name is uh, Daphne. I'm a Daphne Bouteillet Paquet, um, and uh, I am the, the, the moderator uh, of uh, our conversation today. I'm also the, the project manager of the MATCH project, uh, and I work uh, at the International Organization for Migration uh, Country Office for Belgium and, and Luxembourg. Mm, I see that uh, we might not have our presentation uh, on, on the screen yet uh, today, but uh, this is, uh, I believe, uh, fine for uh, just this uh, few welcoming uh, uh, remarks. Uh, let me introduce you the uh, objectives uh, of uh, the, uh, the, 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 this meeting. Uh, as uh, we would like to explore uh, together with you um, the, uh, the benefits uh, of joining uh, the MATCH projects, go through its key objectives and discuss with some uh, guest speakers uh, uh, the benefits of uh, international recruitments. So as you might be already aware, uh, the MATCH project has been developed uh, by the IOM, which is the UN Agency for Migration and uh, this project is funded by the European Commission. Uh, we uh, have launched this project uh, uh, in um, January 2020, uh, and it aims at enabling companies in four European countries uh, to fill up their manpower gaps by recruiting highly qualified uh, talents from Nigeria and Senegal. But I think most uh, importantly, uh, we would like to stress that uh, um, our program also aims at building a business model that meets the needs of comp companies, but also contributes to the transfer of skills and knowledge and allows our young talent to upgrade their skills. Uh, for uh, um, our, our meeting today, uh, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, uh, for uh, uh, three speakers, uh, uh, sorry. So the first speaker of today uh, will be Rob de Lobel, uh, my colleague. Uh, he's our head of, of unit here at the project development uh, unit at IOM. And uh, uh, he will highlight the key features of the MATCH pro uh, project. Um, then uh, I think uh, during this webinar, we will also have the opportunity to go really through a rela reality check uh, with uh, two guest speakers uh, who are actually uh, already uh, working in Nigeria and in Senegal. Uh, we will first hear uh, Cédric, Cédric Filet. Good afternoon, Cédric. Uh, you are the C CEO of uh, Aldelia. Aldelia is a private recruitment uh, uh, company which has an extensive uh, presence in West Africa. And today for us, you will really focus on uh, how to achieve high quality recruitment uh, in Nigeria and Senegal for actually a wide diversity of profile, as you will uh, uh, explain. And then okay. uh, we will uh, welcome uh, Ernesto, Ernesto Sprite, who is the CEO and founder of a company called Tunga. And Tunga is working uh, in many countries uh, across uh, Europe and the world and is offering distance working arrangement. Uh, from earlier conversation with some of you today, uh, we know that at this time of, uh, of crisis, distance working arrangements uh, looks very attractive as a way to overcome actually uh, mobility constraints. So Ernesto, your job will be really to uh, actually uh, walk us through uh, the details uh, and the specifics of uh, remote uh, working and of course give us some tips for uh, the key to success, uh, but also warn us uh, about some of uh, the pitfalls uh, that uh, our participants should be uh, aware of. Last but not least, uh, I think that today we would like to have a better uh, idea of who is with us together in this uh, digital meeting. And um, we have the, the, the pleasure to welcome more than, than 30 participants. Uh, many of you are actually uh, representative of, uh, of companies. And uh, we have uh, decided to run a little poll uh, with 
a few questions just to have a better sense of your background and interest uh, for uh, joining uh, uh, this, this project or at least uh, for uh, international uh, uh, recruitment. So, um, uh, we would like to ask you to actually uh, uh, click on a, on a link which will appear on your slide in a few seconds on the screen and uh, actually uh, join exactly here. Uh, the link is available in the chat, so please click on it and uh, fill up this uh, questionnaire. Um, uh, it will be helpful for us then in the Q&A session uh, to get to know you better and uh, to take into consideration your background when asking questions to our guest speakers. Voila, I think we have a very busy program ahead of us. I, I think now uh, our, our slides are, are working fine. Very much uh, sorry for this uh, hectic uh, start. And uh, without further ado, Rob, please, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. Thank you, Daphne. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, to this webinar also from my side. So I have the pleasure today to um, introduce the MATCH project uh, to all of you, and I have prepared some uh, slides for this. Just give me a second. There we go. Can you see uh, my slides? This stage? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I will just take a few moments to give you the general, uh, you know, introduction to the match uh, project. I will not go too much into any, uh, you know, specificity, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, and as a way of introduction, I wanted to uh, take over this slide that is actually from one of our partners, Agoria, which is the uh, sector uh, federation that represents the technology sector here in Belgium. Uh, and it gives a very good introduction to the context, I think, uh, according to their predictions, and these predictions, of course, are from the pre-corona uh, time, um, they have estimated that in Belgium there will be uh, about 584,000 unfilled vacancies by 2030. Uh, so that is really a very impressive uh, amount, uh, I, I find. Um, and they have uh, put together, you know, a, a kind of plan on how to ideally uh, tackle uh, this problem. Um, today we're going to talk mostly about the first uh, level here that you see in the graph, which is the activation one. Uh, so it's really activating new workers. And obviously uh, the first task there is to activate uh, people that are um, not working yet, uh, non-working uh, population. But what we are going to talk about today uh, for this project is the second block, uh, the 30,000 people uh, that are uh, being targeted through economic uh, migration. And obviously, uh, we're looking at, you know, hiring people from outside Belgium, and that is, of course, uh, to some extent within the EU. But I think it is in particular also true for uh, non-EU countries. Uh, and as you will see today, we will be looking into uh, two uh, African uh, countries. So I just wanted to show you these amounts as well, because indeed we are 2020, 2030 is not that far away. And when you look at the numbers, I think uh, for Belgium only, it is already uh, you know, uh, quite impressive, uh, the lack of manpower that we are facing in the upcoming uh, years. Now for our project in particular, we are working with uh, two countries on the African side. Uh, you have read it most probably. So there is Senegal and Nigeria, uh, one French speaking country and one English speaking country. There's a whole number of reasons why we are working with these countries. It's a, an assessment that was made early on in the project development on the basis of a number of criteria. Obviously, the languages are one of them. But I think also the quality uh, of the, uh, the labor in these countries uh, is, is, is a second uh, important indicator. And thirdly, we also wanted to make sure that there is a, a, a surplus, you know, in labor, uh, that we don't have to go, uh, you know, and take away people that might already be active, for instance, in the local economy. So we're really looking into, uh, you know, two countries with, with a big population uh, and where we know that there are pools of uh, especially young people uh, that are qualified. Uh, and that are also having difficulties in finding jobs uh, in the local economy. 
So that's for what concerns uh, the, the African side. On the uh, European side, we're working with four countries, four EU member states, uh, the Benelux countries, Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg, and then Italy. In Italy in particular, we're working with one region uh, in the north uh, of the country. So this is um, from an overall perspective, uh, the countries and the scope of uh, the match uh, project. Today, of course, we're going to have a discussion on the Belgian case, obviously, yeah? so uh, the audience for today is, uh, is, is Belgian. We are having very similar webinars being set up by our partners in the four other EU uh, countries, so uh, if you would be interested, you can also uh, reach out to those. But how does it work uh, in particular uh, for uh, Belgium? I'm going to walk you through now the different steps. It's a summary of the different steps, uh, hoping to give you a good idea of how we think this thing um, can uh, work. So the first uh, phase, uh, and that's really basically what we're doing also now today, is to reach out to the private sector uh, and to the interested uh, companies for this kind of uh, mobility scheme, right? So. But the first step here is that the interested companies at some point during this project provide IOM with uh, job profiles, vacancies that they are willing to fill mm -hmm. uh, and for which they are willing to explore, you know, uh, the potential of candidates from these two African uh, countries. Uh, once we have those, uh, we will move to uh, step two. So the second step, so after we have received the vacancies from the different uh, companies, the second step is obviously that we will go and do a, a kind of matching exercise, a kind of pre-selection for these companies in the two uh, African uh, countries. So this will be done on the basis of uh, a pre-selection panel, as we call it. Uh, it's a, a, a group of organizations that will, you know, publish the different vacancies in uh, in the African countries and that will go through uh, the candidates uh, uh, as a pre-selection uh, exercise. So these organizations involved are uh, the VDAB uh, in Belgium, the uh, Flemish Public Employment Agency, um, IOM obviously, uh, our offices in both of these countries uh, will be involved. Then we hope also to have the support of the uh, public employment agencies uh, in Nigeria and in Senegal. Uh, and we have the support also of uh, Alderia, um, the private HR uh, company that will be supporting us with the, the, the pre-selection uh, as well. I'm looking at the slides. I don't know if you see them. No, unfortunately, we seem to have a slight technical problem. Yes, thank you. Great. This is, this so, is fine will, now. I'll Yes, I will continue. So w once we have done the pre-selection back in Africa, we will be sharing the top five candidates for each position with the companies in Belgium. So that means, for instance, that if you are a company, you want to recruit someone, we will be sharing the top five candidates that we have identified for you uh, for that position. Of course, if you want to hire more than one individual, then you will receive five, uh, the top five for each of uh, the profiles you are looking for. Um, the final selection, the final recruitment is entirely the responsibility of the companies. So that's step four here. So we are not going to force you to recruit anyone. There is no uh, obligation uh, within this project for you to go through with the one or the other candidate. We are going to suggest candidates and it's up to you then to decide whether yes or no you want to hire uh, these people. So. Uh, you can uh, ask these people, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to do additional tests. You can invite them for interviews. That's really entirely up to you. Uh, and obviously, you can um, ask for support from the project team also with these different uh, phases. Um, it's important to mention that in Belgium, we will be going through the single permit procedure. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody knows it, this procedure, because it's been launched only earlier this year. But it's uh, basically a procedure that has been created in Belgium to attract uh, qualified labor from third countries. So in principle, it is a procedure that should facilitate, you know, everything related to the work permit and the, and the visa uh, for third country nationals um, that want to work uh, or that will be hired uh, by Belgian uh, companies. And then finally, um, we will, of course, assist you also through this project with everything that is related to the logistics and the preparation of these people that would be selected, uh, as well as the pre-departure training. Uh, so before they actually uh, take the plane uh, on the African side, 
we will make sure that they are trained, you know, uh, to explain to them, you know, what the work habits are in Belgium, a, num a number of cultural issues, a number of issues related to soft skills, etc. Uh, and the aim is really to prepare them as best as possible, you know, for the Belgium environment, the Belgian professional environment, knowing that most probably most of these people will never have been in Belgium or in Europe. Uh, and therefore, I think it's important indeed to take some time to train them and to prepare them for this important step uh, in their uh, careers. Now, you will have understood also that with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the project plan as it initially stood will not be able to you know, be implemented according to the same timeline. And so we also want to reassure you that obviously we're not gonna you know, uh, have anyone come over uh, without taking into account the regulations and the restrictions uh, concerning COVID-19, both in Belgium and in the African uh, countries. So most probably there will be a very limited amount of uh, physical uh, mobility um, recruitment, you know, uh, in the next few months. Eh? We will have to see, you know, when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic allows us to, to uh, go ahead, you know, with uh, physical mobility. Um, in the meanwhile, obviously, we're looking into some alternatives, um, one of them being working arrangements from a distance, right? So there, there is a possibility also, and we've checked this also with our partners in Africa, to, for instance, start uh, with hiring people uh, for working from a distance. So you could imagine, instead of having someone coming to your company in Belgium, immediately you could imagine having a, a schedule where you say, well, let's start first, you know, working together for a number of months, uh, but from uh, from your home, uh, and then once this whole uh, COVID pandemic is behind us, we can reassess and see what the possibilities are, you know, for physical uh, mobility. So we will have to take into consideration these elements. I think throughout the project, it's very difficult at this stage to put, you know, dates on these elements. But uh, we are following up very closely and we will make sure that indeed um, we respect all restrictions and, and, and regulations related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a slide on what is in it uh, for uh, the companies, um, participating companies, what would be the benefits, you know, of participating in this uh, scheme? I think the, the most um, straightforward one is the low cost. So that's what you see here. Uh, there are no fees to join the program. Uh, there is uh, also no fee uh, to actually launch a selection process. Um, so um, from that perspective, in a way, you could say that uh, uh, the, the project subsidizes a little bit the, uh, the, uh, the recruitment uh, process. Second, we are looking into qualified professionals. So we are really looking um, into uh, people that would match the needs and the vacancies that we are uh, you know, confronted with in Belgium. And as you've seen in my first slide, we're talking about the technology sector, we're talking about IT, we're talking about digitalization, engineering, energy, and so forth. So it's, it's really mostly uh, qualified professionals. And we will be really looking into the pools you know, of uh, qualified uh, youngsters in these two African countries to try to match the needs that we identify here on the on the Belgian side. Uh, we will have to be uh, flexible and we are flexible all in all, you know, to this, uh, to this uh, mobility scheme. Uh, there is no recruitment obligations, there are no quota. Also, the duration of the job placement is really uh, depending on the needs of the company. Some companies might go for, you know, uh, start with a, 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 a short duration, uh, nine months to one year. Some others might immediately go for a, a, a timing of two years. The whole idea is that we stay within that branch of nine months to two years. And then, you know, it's up to the company after that initial job placement within this project to decide, you know, uh, do I want to continue with this individual or do we stop here, which would then in that case mean that the individual goes back uh, to his country uh, of origin. Um, I think it's an opportunity also to operationalize uh, the diversity strategy of uh, companies and more particularly their diversity at the workplace. So a lot of companies have a policy, have a strategy related to diversity at the workplace. I think by participating in a scheme as, uh, such as this one, uh, it is actually a nice opportunity also to put that in practice uh, and even to test uh, some of the, uh, the elements in the strategy. Um, we will be also focusing within this project on intercultural competence, 
uh, and ethical recruitment. So we have quite some knowledge and expertise on that. So we could indeed also assist uh, the companies with, for instance, elements on ethical recruitment, recruitment, and then again, ethical recruitment in third countries. So it would be focusing on Africa. So at IOM, we have uh, quite some expertise on that that we are willing to share also throughout uh, this project. And then finally, I think uh, it's the last one in the list here, but it's a quite uh, important one. I think it's really an occasion also for companies to, uh, to discover the potential of Africa. Uh, we know from previous projects that the companies that participate in such schemes often, you know, um, are interested by Africa, are hesitating to invest uh, or setting up projects in Africa. Uh, and we've seen that by participating in such a, in such a project, very often, you know, you encounter indeed these individuals, you integrate them in your teams, and then these allow you indeed to take also next steps for what concerns, you know, your investments, your potential investment uh, in, in Africa. So uh, I would say that's also a, a very, uh, a very important one. I move then to the next slide, and this is a slide that gives you an overview of what is expected from you as an employer. So we've listed here a number of uh, things. The first one is uh, related to the employment conditions. So as you might know, under the single permit procedure, there are some conditions that the companies uh, need to uh, apply. Uh, and uh, one of them, obviously, is that you need to be working with the Belgian working contract for these individuals uh, and with the corresponding salary. Uh, so there are some criteria for the salary, you know, uh, in the regulation and the idea is that the salary is indeed aligned to what uh, a, a similar, uh, an individual with similar qualifications would indeed earn in Belgium uh, as well. Um, the second point is that, of course, um, the employed, uh, you will be, the, the persons will be employed according to the job descriptions that you have shared with us, you know, uh, initially. Yeah? So if you're looking for an engineer, well, then it's also obviously expected that this person will be uh, performing tasks of an engineer once this person has been uh, recruited. We expect you to invest in human capital. Um, it's quite straightforward, but I think it's important to mention it uh, uh, anyway. So obviously it's a lot of uh, on-the-job training that we expect from you. It's kind of integrating these people into your activities, into your teams. And by doing that, of course, the idea is that these people would be uh, trained uh, and would be allowed also to develop uh, their skills. If there are external trainings that are relevant for these individuals or even needed to, for them to be able to perform their tasks, I think it would be nice also to allow them to uh, enroll in these uh, trainings. Uh, and we can look at that together eh? because we know that with our partners, Voca Agoria, there are quite some trainings out there. So it's a matter of identifying the right ones and then seeing, you know, whether these individuals would benefit of uh, enrolling in such uh, a training. Throughout the whole uh, project, we will, of course, be uh, monitoring the whole situation. So imagine that you as a company, you hire someone. We will then, you know, at some point in time, ask you, you know, how is it going? Are you happy with this individual? Um, how would you rate, you know, uh, the performance of this individual? Uh, what could have been done better? Uh, would you do it again, etc.? So we will come back to you with these kind of questions uh, to make sure that uh, the things are running as, as smoothly as possible. And in case of problems also that we would be able to identify them and maybe help you uh, with those problems. And obviously we would do the same with the uh, migrants, right? With the African talents. So we would also ask them, you know, how is it going in your company? Uh, are you satisfied? Are you learning a lot of new things, uh, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. Finally, uh, we will encourage uh, these uh, young African talents also to engage, for instance, with the existing diaspora organizations here in Belgium. We know that uh, for Nigeria and Senegal, there's a, a quite active diaspora here in Belgium. Uh, a lot of these diaspora organizations are supporting projects, development projects in their home country, etc. And so we will be looking into possibilities for synergies there as well. And we really hope that uh, the companies that we engage with would also support, you know, these kind of ideas of, you know, uh, besides, of course, the main task of, you know, uh, working uh, within the, the company on, on the specific job, having also the possibility to engage, you know, in uh, diaspora related uh, projects that would, you know, benefit also uh, their countries uh, of origin. 
So that's something that is a bit still to be defined also a, bit on, a little bit on a case by case basis, but uh, it's, I think it's an interesting idea also and uh, we hope to explore the possibilities of such uh, synergies uh, as well. Voila, uh, I think that I, I went through the main, uh, you know, uh, expectations from you as an employer. Um, I want to close with an overview of uh, the team here in Belgium. So as mentioned, uh, we have different project, project partners uh, on board. For what concerns the Flemish Chamber of Commerce, VOCA, uh, we are particularly working with VOCA in West Flanders and East Flanders, where we know that uh, the needs for labor are the highest. And we have uh, our partners Davy and ELS uh, representing uh, those two provinces. Then for the Flemish Employment Agency, we have uh, Lenka, who's also uh, on board. Uh, Daphne, you've uh, heard already um, earlier on. She's the project manager on, the, on behalf of IOM. Uh, for Agoria, we have uh, Jeroen Fransen, um, who's our uh, contact point. And then we are working also with the Chamber of Commerce uh, for the Brussels region, uh, BC, and there our uh, contact person is Vincent Delanois. I want to close with my last slide, um, just to tell you that we are also developing a, a little bit of a visual and communication uh, material. Uh, we are happy to share that with you, uh, so that if you want within your companies or within your partner network, share some information on this initiative uh, or have discussions, you know, uh, internally on whether to join this or not. We have, for instance, developed a brochure. Uh, this is how, what it looks like. I think it's a four page brochure. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you that you find some key data in that brochure as well. And that this will be made available, you know, uh, by the end of this webinar. Uh, we can send you paper formats, electronic formats, uh, in case that would, be, uh, that would be needed, in case you would wish to have uh, some material. So voila, um, I think that is it, you know, in a nutshell from, uh, from my side, I think I can close here and I really look forward to, uh, to receiving also your questions during uh, the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rob, for this uh, very detailed uh, uh, overview. And thank you to all the participants for their patience for our little uh, technical mishaps. Uh, but here we go. This is the reality of the lockdown and of uh, having to uh, meet you all uh, through digital means. Cédric, uh, without further ado, um, we would like to um, actually discuss with you uh, the, um, the activities of, uh, of Aldilia. Uh, so um, it would be good to introduce yourself briefly but also to dive immediately into the topic of today, which is uh, your recruitment methodology. Uh, so please, uh, the, the floor is, is yours. Daphne, thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm calling you from uh, sunny London um, at the moment. So in a few words, Aldilia, um, I will pass very quickly. If you have some questions, I will leave my uh, email on the chat. Um, I've set up Aldilia 15 years ago in London. Uh, we have a huge focus of Africa around human capital, and we are specialized um, in recruitment services from top middle management to uh, uh, trade and labors in various services, various sectors. Uh, but we do also all the outsourcing managements um, of the manpower for our clients from contract of employment, payroll, taxes, immigration, uh, medical insurance, pension from A to Z. We work for companies like Microsoft. Coca-Cola, Heineken, Total, Exxon, uh, Cisco, Fujitsu, etc., etc. Could be big companies, but also Pan-African companies, SMEs, and more and more fintech companies. Um, you've seen our presence: 12 countries, both English, French, uh, and Portuguese-speaking countries. Uh, and usual uh, experience, for example, in Nigeria, with uh, we just celebrated on 11th anniversaries uh, of presence in Nigeria and five years in in Senegal. Uh, just to give you an idea, last year we've done $15 million uh, turnover in, in Nigeria. So that's for, for Aldilia and uh, why we've managed to uh, survive sometimes uh, over, over these years um, is because we, we've up, had a very, very straight, strict uh, approach uh, in terms of uh, selection. You know, in Africa you will have access to a huge number of 
hungry, desperate, talented people. Uh, so first of all, we have the identification phase and the test and the assessment and then the shortlist. Uh, in terms of candidate identification, where do we find or, or candidates or talents that would be of interest for, for you is on the own uh, database uh, on the, the diaspora we found uh, in West Africa, but outside West Africa as well wants to, to return. Um, we've got our local recruitment teams as well in countries, both in Nigeria and in Senegal with their own network, all uh, contact and our own database locally through local advertising, uh, head hunting, network. Uh, word of mouth is Africa. In Africa, it's very, very important, very uh, strong, uh, but also the, the social networks are very, very, very strong, very, very used. Uh, the, um, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and so on and so on works a lot into recruitment. And recently we had to, um, to develop the digital aspect because when you have to to check, to read, to assess uh, thousands uh, of CVs, you cannot do it uh, manually. So we've developed the uh, Ariba Job uh, platform, which is a matching platform, automatic matching platform. Um, so that's that help to do the, the candidate identification, centralization. And then once we have the pool of candidates, we move into the, the test and the assessment side. Um, that means one, even if we receive five, 10,000 applications, even 100, um, we have the capabilities to do automatic matching with Ariba jobs, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, but also uh, with the fact that we are giving tests to pass to the candidate, to the talents. Uh, it could be soft skills, could be technical skills, uh, whatever we decide with the client in order to funnel from hundred thousand to tens or uh, units uh, and then once we have identified these people and that we made sure that what's on the series uh, is uh, matched with test results uh, because the, the tests are timed and registered thinned so we just want to make sure that um, that the right person was attending the, the test and then he... we finalize we organize a face-to-face or a video at the moment um, interview to assess both the soft skills, motivation, but also sometimes the technical skills. And once we have done the first and second interview, then we go into the shortlist and that's where you will receive uh, the short two, three, five candidates per position who have been already assessed, but that you will be assessing them with your own criteria, both technical and personal HR based on your HR policies within your, within your interview, within your company, sorry. Uh, Didn't, and sorry the... to, to interrupt. Uh, uh, I hope you hear me well. Yes. Yes, you do. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, before uh, going further into a conversation, I would just need to uh, ask uh, kindly um, the uh, participants that are representative from a private company to to actually contribute to our live poll because we we had very few uh, answers so far. But actually, I can see that many uh, participants have uh, have joined since the the beginning of this of this webinar, and maybe they are not aware that we are running a poll. It would be, I think, very helpful for us for our uh, Q and A uh, uh, session. Uh, to get a better uh, understanding of your of your background, and actually uh, let me make a link with my second question, as you have um, really um, I think clarify for us uh, the key steps for your uh, selection uh, process. Um, I think let me ask you something um, blunt, but we often uh, understand from from uh, companies working uh, in in the field that recruitment process uh, unfortunately uh, m might uh, actually suffer from from some external interference uh, mm -hmm. this is this is really uh, something quite uh, 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 difficult uh, that many companies seems to to experience so can you just in in a few words uh, uh, explain to the to the participants how do you make sure that the recruitment is fair and complies with uh, with ethical standards Okay, that's a very uh, important question. And uh, in terms of uh, compliance and ethical, um, there is 
several things. Uh, first one, to reply to your to your answer about uh, how can we uh, react when we've got a local partner, a local authorities, or some someone who wants to interfere with the recruitment in proposing his uh, nephew and his son, his neighbor for political or whatever reason. Very simple, through the test. You know, we are able to test the people. So if someone wants to go into the recruitment process, he goes. He goes into the recruitment process, he goes into the testing uh, aspects of the, of the recruitment process, and then he gets a ranking. If he's good for what we want him to do, we will propose him a job. However, if he doesn't uh, reach the minimum that we've decided with our, with our clients, we can explain with information, with data, that this specific person didn't reach uh, this minimum for this specific job. However, we could have other opportunities in other sectors. Like this, we give back to uh, the sponsor of this candidate, this fantastic candidate, something to explain to the one who has pushed his own CVs. So like this, we can document and uh, the, the, the results, the test doesn't, doesn't lie and uh, it's, uh, it's an independent one. So it's, it's working very, very well. In terms of compliance, this is key. You know, this is very important and this is why we've been in Africa 15 years and still up and running because we comply with both local regulation and we anticipate the, 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 the change, the moves, with being compliant with international standards and regulations. Uh, this is very important. We'll talk about GDPR later on. It's not because there is no GDPR regulation in Africa that you cannot, uh, you don't need to do, to comply. Uh, discrimination is very important. We cannot discriminate anyone, you know. Uh, we can think that there is a lot of uh, discrimination in Africa. I can tell you today in terms of gender, at Africa, the 50% of the, Af the Aldilia staff in Africa are women. 50% of the country managers, and we've got 12 countries uh, operating and soon 14, 50% uh, of the country manager of the managers are women. So that works and this is possible. What is important is the ethic as well. You know, we are talking about uh, the candidate, I will come back on it, but the, the employers as well. We need to make sure, and we are making sure, that the employers are fair employers, that uh, there is a background check on employers, making sure that they pay the people on time, they pay the taxes, and, and so on and so on. Uh, on the talent side, we are testing them, once again, very important, but we do background check, police check. Uh, we call back the, the previous employers, and we make sure that uh, what's on the CVs, uh, it's what was what has happened um, and once again we don't charge talents okay unfortunately for our, our friend attending the, um, the webinar if, if you need all services you will be charged uh, I'm sorry for that uh, but we need to be profitable to make sure that um, we can survive uh, on the continent and carry on uh, delivering uh, the best services so we don't charge the talents uh, the, 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 on the company side. In terms Deco. of um, um, what's and written for us, what is, what doesn't, what's not written doesn't exist. So all the contract, the pension, the insurance, uh, and people in Africa are managed like if we were managing people in Europe. This is very, very important. And we've got um, a support to them uh, when they have any problem, you know, and because sometimes details make a difference. When they call you, it's because they want to be paid a bit earlier, they need a loan, or they've got a question for the medical insurance because the child is um, sick. So responding very, very quickly, avoid lots of issues, strikes, difficulties, and so on and so on. So that's how we manage the, our ethical uh, aspect and the compliance aspect of our job in Africa. Cedric, thank you very much. I think we will have time during the Q&A to go through your tips for uh, companies that are considering hiring uh, young talents. But I would like now to turn to uh, Ernesto. Uh, Ernesto uh, from the company uh, Tunga. Uh, maybe you would like to introduce yourself uh, uh, briefly and in explain us why you're interested in this, uh, in this topic. Yeah, sure, thanks. So my name is Ernesto Spruit and I'm the founder of uh, Tunga. So we founded the company in 2015. 
And basically what we do is that we have a pool of uh, software programmers in various African countries. Um, and the pool is about 350, 400 developers. And they work through us for companies in Europe and the United States. Um, and uh, how it works is that we recruit the developers to enter our platform. We test them thoroughly in a similar fashion that Cedric also described just now. Uh, and once the company has a need for a developer, they send us a profile and then um, let's say because we, that we've already got them all in the database and we have them already tested, etc. Uh, we can present uh, candidates uh, immediately and the candidates usually can start working uh, usually let's say within a week or something like that so very quickly and um, but they work remotely uh, through us right so uh, the candidates usually when we provide service are not relocated to, to Europe but they work from Africa their home country either from home or from a co-working space or something like that they work for the clients uh, and Ernesto there is a question that we often get from mm -hmm. from from companies uh, I would say that uh, for the uh, IT, uh, ICT uh, sector, you have countries like India that are re really well known. So uh, why, why would you advise a company to work uh, with uh, talents from Nigeria or Senegal? W why are they interested as uh, source countries? Well, if you look at uh, within Africa, there is um, a number of countries uh, that have uh, English as a native language. In Senegal, it's uh, French. So obviously, if you are a French speaker, that is an advantage. Uh, and uh, English proficiency is really well. It's the same time zone. And um, the fees are uh, a, a competitive. Um, so the, if you look at the salary levels and there's just a huge untapped pool of developers there that just didn't uh, get on the market yet. So it's a little bit unexplored territory, but if you know how to um, go around, then you have relatively easy access to uh, very good developers. So. And uh, uh, precisely, uh what would be your, your advice? What are the key success factors and what are the, the pitfalls in working in these countries today? <clears throat> um, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, maybe to illustrate, because I don't know what is the, a, a lot of potential customers that we talk to, they really have no idea what the African landscape looks like, right? But there is a number of countries that have really a thriving tech scene, among which Nigeria and Senegal. So you see a huge growth of tech hubs, et cetera, et cetera. And with that comes a lot of um, professionals that just have good technical skills, good programming skills. Uh, in my opinion, when it goes wrong, it's usually not because of the lack of skills, because that's easily easy to establish also early on whether someone has the technical skills to be successful. Um, the big risk is the what we call soft skills, or at least where there is the cultural differences, right? So a lot of the people who work for us and people who are on the market, they are either, but at least for a significant part, they are self-taught whether they were on university or not, but uh, a lot of these problems because this knowledge uh, evolves very quickly. So you have to be able to be self-taught, et cetera, et cetera. But learning how to function in a team uh, with people from another country who you never met, et cetera, it's quite challenging, right? So you really have to make sure that you create an environment for the developer. And I'm talking now once again about remote working, right? A remote working environment for them to be successful. So uh, first of all, it starts with that you have to uh, check beforehand what is the soft skill. So we have a number of tests uh, for that to, to see, okay, how do they communicate? How do they manage tasks? How do they deal with deadlines, et cetera, et cetera? How do they deal with certain problems that regularly arise in a remote work setting. So uh, let's say prevention is uh, the best. So once, once we've established, okay, these skills are good and they're, uh, they're there, then it's very important to uh, set 
uh, clear rules of engagement, right? Because um, yeah, you cannot expect from someone who is in another country, from another culture, etc., to know how you would like to have uh, things done best, right? Every company is different. Every company has different procedures. So you have to be very clear about what are the rules of engagement, how do you want to cooperate, etc. And within that, I find that it's much more helpful to steer on output as opposed to steering on the process. Um, how do you mean? Well, if you have workers, let's say, in your office, then uh, it's rather easy and also normal, let's say, to keep an eye on them and to make sure everyone is there within working hours and that kind of stuff. When it's remote, it's much more about do you uh, have productivity that I want from you or do you have the output that I hired you for, right? So the discussion is much more about, okay, when will you have with what chunk of work done and not so much about okay on what hours will you work on it although it's very important to agree on communication rules plus so when should you uh, be reachable uh, uh, how long do we think it's uh, uh, acceptable to uh, let's say a to give a response within a certain time etc so you have to have clear rules for that but you should not try to police the person on the other side in, in terms of see what is he doing now, etc. You should just make sure that you have a solid meeting rhythm, a solid reporting rhythm. Uh, so, for example, with us, all the developers who work for us, they get a daily a mini survey on where they report on uh, uh, quality and progress uh, of the work so that we have kind of an early warning system that we can see, OK, something is not going right there if it happens. Uh, um, so, so that's what I mean by that. Thank you, uh, thank you for, for, for that, uh, Ernesto. I think you've pointed out uh, quite a few uh, interesting things that maybe we, want to, we will want to discuss further during the, the Q&A with our participants. But let me ask you a last, uh, a last question. Uh, as Rob pointed out uh, in his presentation, uh, obviously with uh, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, distance working arrangement look very attractive. Now, uh, is there any costs or legal obligations or, or any anything uh, like that that companies should be aware of? What, what, what type of costs you are uh, thinking about? Uh, any any t any type of uh, of uh, uh, you know um, hidden costs that company would not be aware of or legal problems that could you know uh, 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 be a, 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 a trick to them. I mean, uh, is there yeah. is there anything yeah. that you would like to warn the companies about? Because of course, I mean, this market is booming. You have lots of service providers, but yeah. uh, what would be your your advice to them? Well, if you go through a service provider like us, you don't have uh, those problems because you just have a contract <laughs> with the service provider, right? Uh, but if you would uh, say, okay, I want to have a contract directly with the, the employee uh, in that country, then you would have to dive into, okay, what are your tax obligations? Uh, what is uh, normal salary level there? Um, what uh, rules should I adhere to, right, to, to create uh, this working environment. Uh, then there's payment costs. So uh, to get the money there, it, you know, it requires some setting up some infrastructure uh, to be able to make the payments, etc. Uh, and, and that's actually quite expensive. Uh, we pay a lot of in, uh, financial fees for uh, transferring money, etc. So, uh, you know, but it's not impossible. It's just uh, if you're serious about it and it's for the long term, it's probably worth uh, the effort. If it's more like a short term or you don't know yet or you want to try it out, it's probably more easy to go through a service provider that has the infrastructure for that. Thank you very much, Ernesto, uh, again for uh, this, uh, this very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, I think that um, before uh, actually uh, opening the, the floor to the participants for, for questions, and please 
uh, do not hesitate to actually ask uh, your question through the chat function. Maybe Nelson, you would like to introduce us with the outcome of our poll. Do we have uh, more information about who is in the room with us today? Is there any interesting outcome? So yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so has uh, uh, the private sector representative who filled the um, poll could see, we asked you a few questions to better understand a bit who um, who is in the call today with us. So we had the uh, six responses that give us a sample of uh, the people that are joining us today. Uh, we have uh, companies that um, a very well balanced uh, between companies who have uh, uh, non-EU citizen working for them and those who do not. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, uh, there is already quite um, quite some experience uh, in recruiting also from third countries here. Um, and uh, I, I, we can also see that uh, there are companies that recruit from Africa, uh, as well as companies that uh, work with uh, Asian nationals, so from, from, from countries in Asia and in South America. Uh, we can also see that um, the majority of the respondents do have an ethical recruitment or a diversity policy in place in their company. Uh, I would like to stress that we're talking about Belgian companies, so we specifically asked uh, the people working in multinationals to focus on their office in Belgium. Um, and uh, we also asked whether they, uh, their, their company currently have a plan to invest uh, or start activities in, in Nigeria and Senegal, or they, if they already have. And we can see that, yes, uh, uh, two people either have plans or already have uh, um, two companies, so apology do have uh, activities or plan to have activities uh, in uh, both countries, so both Senegal and Nigeria. We have uh, two people that, mm, sorry, two companies that uh, currently do not have uh, either plans or activities in the two countries to which we can add other two that um, answered uh, uh, a simple no to the question. And then uh, the last uh, uh, interesting element, uh, we also wanted to know whether uh, the participants already had activities also in other African countries. So to uh, broaden a bit the scope, the scope also of our discussion. Uh, and we can see that uh, we have uh, one company who has uh, activities in Ethiopia, uh, one company that has activity in South Africa, one in Togo and one in Tunisia. So I think this is, a, this is a good sample of our participants, and I think we can also start our discussion on the basis of the data we, we collected here, Daphne. Thank you very much, Nelson, for, for that. And indeed, I find that it's always interesting to, to know uh, who is uh, with us uh, in, in, in the room. And uh, as we were preparing, uh, this, uh, this discussion with our colleagues from VOCA, from BESI, so the Chambers of, uh, of Commerce here in, in, in Belgium. Uh, the, the point was to say, yes, of course, there is an interest. Yes, of course, uh, 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 this is uh, probably the way to go. But um, companies here in Belgium are a little bit on hold because of the COVID-19 crisis. We see also that companies are, are fighting literally for their survival. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to abuse my position as a moderator and, and take uh, the privilege to uh, ask you the first question um, to you, Ernesto and, and, and Cedric. Uh, what is in the real impact of, the, of this crisis on your respective activities? Uh, the impact, let's say, on the pace and, and the volume of your activities, uh, but also maybe on the on the nature even. Um, Ernesto. Well, in one sense, it's a little bit early to say, so I'm curious how I would answer this question six months from now. Uh, but uh, we are a very fast growing company, so we have been doubling our growth in the past four years. So each year we grow 100%. And um, that growth at this moment uh, has stalled over the past month, right? So it's kind of like uh, the whole uh, speed <laughs> is out of the company. Um, because you see that uh, um, a lot of uh, potential customers, they just put everything on hold, right? Um, 
but I also can see because this was uh, especially the first two weeks, like the second half of March. Uh, existing customers, almost all of them, they just stayed the course. So uh, in that sense, no impact. Uh, and I can also see the pipeline filling up again. So you can see, so after the first shock, companies are making plans again. And I think that we see, uh, you know, where where we had clients or leads uh, in the hospitality related sectors. Yes, those are in trouble. And there's, but on the other hand, there we see also new sectors rising like health and education, etc., where the demand actually is growing. Uh, so in that sense, I'm optimistic. Um, we do see that there is less scarcity on the Dutch market, at least uh, for uh, software developers. Uh, but I think that it's, it's, it seems to be more like a temporary thing because I don't think that uh, the whole scarcity dissolved all of a sudden. <laughs> Uh, it's just that you got a lot of movement of uh, people, for example, with KLM, the airline, they uh, relieve like 15,000 IT specialists from one day to the other. Yeah, so now they have to be placed, but I think when all this dust has settled, then we still will have scarcity. <clears throat> and then there is, uh, I think, a number of advantages of working with uh, African developers over working with locals in any case. So I don't think that market will disappear whatever happens. Uh, altogether, I would say uh, the impact it's in the short term, it's, an, it's, yeah, it's negative, but it's not as it is in other sectors, right? There's no disaster. Uh, and in the longer term, probably it will stall growth a little bit for us, but I don't, uh, but I think we still think that we're going to grow 50% or something like that this year if I look at the pipeline right now. And you, Cedric, how do you see things? Okay, uh, on our side, we've seen a uh, reduce of activities the first two, three weeks uh, in some sectors, uh, mainly oil and gas, not linked to uh, COVID-19 or maybe the reducing of the economy, but uh, the, the short, the, the price of the barrel, you know, so a barrel at $20 means uh, some oil and gas projects we just stopped. On the other sectors, I can tell you that between end of mid-March, and the end of June, we would have recruited 200 people in Africa. So we can see some traction. We can see some existing project carrying on. We can see some new project going in. Um, so we, and, and as we speak, as we speak, we are opening two more countries in Africa, one in Egypt, one in Tunisia, on top of the 12 we are having. So yes, we might not reach the the, the the numbers we we've planned uh before this crisis for 2020 uh, however we will keep the level of activities and we will grow a little bit not maybe as much but we will grow so happy uh happy with that and we'll be even more ready for for 2021 or end of 2020 when it will start again so i've got no, no issues about that so there is light at the end of the of the tunnel when I hear the two of you, but we have questions now coming from the audience. And uh, yes. let me maybe uh, pick up uh, one that um, often comes uh, to our conversation with uh, with companies. Could you please elaborate a bit more on the on the profile and the education level, in particular uh, in the uh, in the IT, uh, uh, for instance, which kind of programming lang language? uh is uh is available uh um and uh um uh are these people only competent just to execute tasks or do they do they also offer competence uh to solve uh, uh problems um I think that maybe a, you and then Ernesto it's a very uh, very common question and uh it's a very interesting question um, I can um, I can tell you uh, today that uh, every day, every week, I'm amazed by the level of candidates I am I have re I'm receiving. You know, uh, there is more MIT graduate in Nigeria than maybe both French, France and uh, Belgium. You know, um, it's not about uh, who we can find. You know, which kind of languages we can find in Nigeria. It's more, tell me which version of Java you want 
uh, to recruit and how many of them do you want and then we will be able to find them so these people are very hungry to learn they are very very good and if you look at the numbers and we're discussing this in another webinar so uh, if you look at uh, the population of Netherlands Belgium Luxembourg 27 million people that's the population of Lagos Lagos, so one city, and the, the average age in terms of uh, working population is 44 years old in Europe, is 18 years old in Nigeria. So we've got a large population of qualified people. In terms of percentage, might be smaller than in Europe, but in terms of number, it's much, much bigger. So uh, you've got great people, there are very entrepreneurial they are very dynamic and believe me they take lots of decision you know you need to canalize their energy um, and they're not only doers they are great yeah. great entrepreneurs and great great people and if but I then, might add on so to add on that and I think the question is more specific I believe that the uh, participants are interested to to really understand how do you manage to test the skills? How, how do you manage to really assess objectively the level of qualifications, Ernesto? Okay. So first, if I may add on what Cedric says, because it's a very important point um, in my experience, and I also used to work with IT people in the Netherlands, let's say. But in the Netherlands, IT people generally, they're actually quite uncommunicative right so they're more like technical nerds if you will uh, uh, who uh, have a certain mindset in africa i meet a lot more people for whom this is really an opportunity to improve their lives so their whole mindset is uh different much more entrepreneurial as cedric says much more eager no prima donna behavior right so so actually for me it's much more fun to work with the African uh, IT people than Dutch. So that's just a general comment uh, on that. Um, and um, so if, in terms of how do you test, we have a whole range of tests that we use depending on what, what we want to test for. So this, uh, yeah, a lot of tests is just standardized uh, knowledge tests, right? So it could be multiple choice, it could be them. Uh, solving a uh, coding problem and then we can make screen recording you can even see how they move around etc uh, etc et how long they take so you can go very in depth uh, for the technical skills uh, and we and we have because there's also the question what languages we have every popular framework and language is available on the market here and you have Obviously, oh, of course, you have you juniors who are not so good yet, but you also have a lot of mediators and a lot of seniors. Uh, so it's and, just depending on what you need. And, and, and uh, Ernesto, I think our follow-up questions, uh, uh, as I've, we've received quite a, a few now, uh, sorry okay. for interrupting you. Mm. Uh, we have here, uh, actually, if I uh, can uh, recognize the name, a colleague from uh, Enable. Enable is the, development, the Belgium Development uh, Agency. That is uh, asking, I think, uh, a question to the link to, to the first uh, question that we discussed, which is a brain drain issue. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we are all, you know, uh, eager to meet the needs of, uh, of, the, of the companies. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about uh, the development uh, back uh, in those source uh, countries? How do we make sure that we do not, uh, we do not harm these countries more than we, than we help by setting up such program? Well, I can only speak for myself. Of <laughs> so course, of for, for my company, um, because we, one reason that we don't relocate as a company the developers to Europe is, is because of this. So we don't want to relocate them. Uh, and I know that within your program, they also are going to relocate it back, etc. So uh, this is one thing. Other thing is that we invest in the pool, right? So we have training programs. Uh, and we're training at this moment, I think, uh, 200 developers. Uh, we have a program where we train 125 developers offline. So this is in actual classes. And then we have an online uh, e-learning environment, which is just uh, live. So we're just launching it, but we're going to expand very qu uh, quickly. 
so what happens with us, you get tested and then you can get you, you can define improvement areas, right? So when you got when you fill the test, you're not just sent away. We send you to the testing platform or to the learning platform, etc., so that you can improve your skills. So for us, it's very and this is all no strings attached. We provide this for free. Uh, and uh, they're they're also not obliged to work through us after that, etc. So we recognize the importance of also investing in the pool, right? And our philosophy is, if we invest in the pool, what goes around comes around. You know, we work with the developers that uh, we want to work with, but there's also you know enough uh, investment in skills for other markets, local markets, etc. And Rob, maybe uh, before giving the, the, the floor to, uh, to Cédric, uh, will, will our mobility uh, scheme actually fuel brain drain? And how, how can we address that within the context of the MATCH project? Yeah, I think it's really a very, a very good question. And eh? so it's, uh, it's something that we will need to see you now. We, we, we know also from previous, ex uh, previous experience, similar projects, you know, um, that for instance, uh, not all of these migrants will be staying uh, in Belgium. Eh? So under the hypothesis that COVID will be behind us and that people will physically move to Belgium. Uh, the whole idea of the project is obviously that um, it's a job placement for a fixed term. Uh, and then it's really up to the company and the migrants to decide whether this can be prolonged or not. We uh, know from experience that not everybody will be staying. So a lot of people will also be returning uh, to their country of origin. And we obviously hope that they will be returning with an increased set of skills, right? Um, so that's one thing uh, that I wanted to add. Um, we, we know also from previous experience that um, the companies generally that are interested uh, on the European side, you know, to participate very often already have somewhere in the back of their mind uh, an idea of what they want to do in Africa. Some of them, you know, want to invest. Some others uh, are setting up a project. Some are working with a partner. Um, you know, there's a, a big variety of reasons, you know, why companies, uh, you know, hire uh, these people. But we have seen from previous projects that the vast majority uh, ends up very often, you know, working with these individuals back in the country of origin. So that could be, for instance, that they then hire these individuals in their local office in that country or that they hire these people to work on a specific project or with a partner or that these individuals become, you know, commercial representatives for a region or for a country in Africa. These kind of stories we have seen that in uh, previous projects. And so we truly believe that it's also, you know, by um, working with these companies that are interested in Africa, that there is also an added value that is generated, you know, for the uh, African uh, economies. Now, for what concerns the, 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 the purely individual element, the whole thing is, of course, uh, the whole ambition is, of course, not to go and take away, you know, staff that, that are working in established companies in Nigeria or Senegal because that would really be, you know, hampering the development of these companies and the local economy. And that's also, I think, why throughout this whole discussion we've been having today, we've been really also focusing on uh, younger graduates, right? So we're really also looking into this big pool. And I think uh, it's been highlighted, it's a huge amount of young people. The average age is way lower than in Europe. Uh, but this big pool of young people, you know, that are graduating, about to graduate, just graduated, that are, you know, training themselves, you know, in tech hubs, etc. This is really also our core uh, target audience, I think, in the uh, African countries. It doesn't exclude, of course, that there's people, you know, with some experience that could participate. But I think that we keep our focus, you know, on that group. Uh, and that in that sense, we try to uh, limit, you know, as much as possible uh, any uh, brain drain. Daphne, back sorry. to you. Yes, uh, sorry, I did uh, mute myself, so the conversation was not as fluid. Um, Cédric, just maybe a final word on that, and uh, and maybe we can uh, take the other questions as well. Yes, um, you know, uh, quickly, we, Ernesto and, uh, and Rob co covered it very, very well. You know, first of all, we will never dry um, the number of people and talents in Africa. Uh, every year, 20 million people arrive on the job market, 20 million people. So it is also an example to others um, to see that some talents can go to Europe, get trained, come back. Even if some stays, why not? You know, so there will be the big brother or big sister 
of, of others. So I think it's it's important, and these kind of uh, programs are, are very important. Um, that will drive by uh, by leadership, you know, and and qualification. So um, there's no brain drain, and we are enough ethical to, to not to um, not not to do it anyway. So. Um, there is a, a control uh, from both Ernesto and, and myself who are, who are facing it on a, on a daily basis. Uh, uh, Cédric, maybe uh, the next question is also uh, relevant uh, for you. Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, we have a participant uh, that is uh, asking, um, how do you uh, actually work with the public employment agencies? Uh, uh, so, um, if you'd like to expand okay. on that. So yes, yes, I, I thought it was the, the other question on the client. I, I was ready to, to share my screen again, uh, <laughs> but uh, I know you like to challenge me, uh, Daphne, so that's fine. Um, for for the, the agencies, it's very important to, to, to work with them. Uh, you know, um, they're called public agencies, public employment agencies, but it's not, it's not exactly the same services you can expect that the one we have in Europe. So sometimes we have to partner, we have to support, we have to train, we have to do for them. Um, but we we work on their side. Um, we involve them sometimes on the recruitment, especially sometimes we have to justify that we have to recruit expats because we couldn't find locals trained enough. Uh, and that will be, a, I will come back on it, um, because some companies will like to have local people at management level or technical level, but don't find the local skills. So we involve these agencies to identify, to, ma to map the market and to show that there is some shortage of skills as well in Africa. And um, what we can do to partner as well with universities to train the trainers in order to, uh, um, to match the needs of our clients. And then I think you were talking about brain drain but uh, it could be a brain feed as well, because even companies who have operation in Africa could recruit African talents, African young engineers or technicians, bring them to Europe in order to train them to take more responsibilities in their own plants, in their own services, to represent them back in Africa, to develop their business. So for me, this program address uh, three, three types of people. The, the companies who doesn't have business in Africa and the one who has business in Africa. For the one who do, don't have business in Africa, they can recruit fantastic new clients, uh, new, sorry, new talents who will bring them new culture, new dynamism, different way of thinking, uh, different skills as well. And the skills they need and they cannot find in Europe. The, if, and then they keep the talents in, uh, in Europe. Then there is the one who doesn't have business in Africa and are willing to do business in Africa. And then you can recruit someone in Africa, train them in your processes, tools, uh, services, and then bring them back to Africa to expand, to scale up your own business in Africa, whether it's Nigeria or Senegal. And the, the third part is are the one who have business in Africa and doesn't have the, the whole skills in Africa, the trained people, and that's where you can take African people, train them in Europe, bring them back to give them more management technical responsibilities. Very important. So as we are reaching the end of this webinar, we have still have a few questions, but I think that are more directly to the match project. So Rob, maybe you can uh, take uh, these, uh, these questions. So uh, our uh, um, actually, our participants would, would like to know uh, whether uh, the young talents will already have the linguistic skills, and if not, we will uh, if we will uh, train them uh, in our pre-departure orientation uh, uh, sessions. Then, uh, obviously, there is another interesting question, which probably Cédric and Ernesto know well as well which is uh, the um, different uh, cultural background that uh, those young talents have, uh, which might uh, actually create some type of tension uh, back in, in the workplace uh, in, in Belgium. And are we planning to offer some sort of uh, intercultural training or uh, help uh, companies uh, to really uh, create an inclusive uh, environment to uh, help the soft landing of those uh, young uh, workers. 
And the last question uh, uh, from uh, the audience um, is, uh, in our previous experience, uh, have we already developed similar mobility schemes with other countries in, in Africa? And uh, in such a case, uh, did small and medium uh, companies join the program? Or are these programs mainly open to, uh, let's say, uh, the big players, uh, multinationals and large groups? Rob, I think yes. you may want to answer that first. Yeah, I will go very, very rapidly and then I can uh, then I begin give the floor to the other uh, speakers as well. So for what concerns the language skills, no, there is no uh, language training uh, before departure for the selected candidates. So, but as I explained, we are looking at people who speak uh, fluently English or French, Nigeria or Senegal. Um, and there is, of course, a possibility to enroll these people in language courses once they are uh, in Belgium. We can look into that, you know, with our different partners uh, here uh, in Belgium. Potentially, you could also ask, you know, interested uh, people, uh, the, the people that you would be interested in hiring also to, to enroll in online language skills before departure. So that, that, that option exists, but it's not a mandatory step within the overall uh, match uh, project. The second question related to their cultural habits, the cultural background, I think it's very, very important to recognize uh, that this is uh, probably the main challenge in this whole uh, type of uh, mobility scheme. So we've seen in uh, previous projects that indeed in terms of technical competences, uh, the candidates quite well match the expectations of the companies on the European side. However, for what concerns more the cultural soft skills elements, there is a quite significant gap between the expectations and uh, let's say, you know, the, uh, the habits of uh, the candidates. So we really want to uh, work on that. Um, I think it's very important in the pre-selection process to keep that in mind as well. I think it's very important that we look for people that have the right attitude and attitude is not just, you know, habits and cultural elements. Uh, we are looking for people, you know, that want to invest in their CVs, in their careers, that want to be part of this and that want to do all of this for also the right reasons. Uh, we've had cases in previous projects indeed where there was a complete mismatch at that level and where we had to send people back to Africa, you know, after one or two weeks uh, uh, in Belgium. So we need to take that into consideration, I think, also in the, in the pre-selection. And second, indeed, we, we need to prepare these people. And so I mentioned it in my presentation, this pre-departure training is exactly on this. That's one thing, uh, but we are very conscious that habits uh, will not change from one week to the other. So even if you give them a one week training, not everything will be solved with that. So we are also looking into assisting the companies that will be hosting these individuals uh, with some, you know, trainings, uh, you know, uh, guidance on uh, intercultural dialogue, integration of these people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a number of things that already exist, uh, and I think for companies that have not, uh, that, that don't have the habit, you know, of hiring uh, Africans, I think it's uh, probably good that we also have a chat with them and see whether there is a need for this kind uh, of uh, assistance. So we will be working both on the side of the migrants, uh, but also on the side of the European companies if that would be required eh? because it's needs driven it's not systematic uh, it's only uh, in case the companies would ask us uh, to do that uh, then for what concerns the size of the companies I think from previous experiences we see that it's quite diverse um, very often the, vac the big multinationals they know their way to Africa they know their way to uh, international recruitment they have their processes so they don't often need this type of project you know to uh, you know enlighten them uh, nevertheless there's always big companies you know uh, interested as well but very often i see a lot of smes as well and eh? so smaller companies sometimes even companies that have never you know recruited internationally that that, that have no direct link with uh, africa at this stage but that might you know in the future build up something you know on the african continent so i think all in all uh, it's probably a very mixed group uh, and there could be a potential interest from uh, the different uh, different companies, different sectors, uh, different sizes. So I think for me, I leave it here and I'm happy to uh, hand over the floor to uh, compliment, you know, from the side of uh, the other speakers. Ernesto or um, Tereik. One minute each, as we are really beyond schedule. Okay, um, if I can take just this one, I will share one last uh, screen and uh, it's maybe to, uh, to show you the, um, the interest and, uh, of, of working in Africa. 
this is just an extract and it's not exhaustive of the client we've been working in the last uh, six months. Um, and this needs to be added because we have uh, two, three new more clients uh, on the continent. That means if you have these clients in Europe, you're delivering your services to these clients, you can deliver it to, uh, to them in Africa. You can, and they will be very happy to have you next to them. Um, these clients, even if some of them are massive, sometimes when they go to a new country in Africa, they are small as an SME, they are SMEs, they start with one person. So it's just to show you the, the potential, the clients you are, you have in Europe are in Africa or will be in Africa. So that's uh, very interesting and I wanted to, to share this with, uh, with all the attendees. Ernesto, so, would you like to um, share some thoughts? Yeah, very briefly, because I don't have to add too much. I can just say our clients, they are uh, almost exclusively SMEs. So that's our focus market. And uh, we find that, uh, you know, the fact we can um, onboard them affordably, flexibly, and very quickly developers lands well, uh, the process very lightweight. So for us, uh, that uh, fits well. And a lot of the entrepreneurs, they also uh, you know, quite open to uh, creative solutions, uh, which is, this is one for them because uh, they have alternatives. So we are focused on Africa, but the clients obviously not, right? So, for, but for them, this is an interesting option usually. So, but for me, it's SMEs mostly. I would like to thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, actually these uh, excellent presentations uh, and answering uh, the questions uh, of the of the audience. Uh, I can see that there are a few questions that uh, we were not able to cover uh, during this uh, this webinar. Uh, I can see uh, questions, for instance, uh, about assistance uh, to the returnees. So, what about uh, what happens at the end uh, of the of the project? Um, maybe you will want to contact us for a follow-up conversation, but just to stress that uh, during their uh, job placement, we will encourage our young talents to develop their own project. We will ask the company to shoulder them. We will also uh, proactively look for companies back in Nigeria and Senegal uh, that might be interested to hire them back. So indeed, uh, we have a, a, a sort of the reintegration, as we as we call that uh, process, and but we will be happy to to speak with you and give you further uh, details. So please do not hesitate to reach out to to us, the IOM uh, team, uh, the match team in in Belgium, but also to our uh, speakers uh, of today, Cedric and Ernesto. I'm sure that you would be very glad uh, uh, actually to uh, answer some of the the specific questions raised by by our very active audience uh, today. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much to you all and uh, have a very nice end of the afternoon. Super. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.